This is Granger Metter. I do technology and communications for the Bartlesville Public Schools. I'm going to take you on an overview of school funding in Oklahoma. This presentation is from April 2018. In the early 1990s, school funding for in, in Oklahoma improved dramatically with House Bill 1017. This legislation was pushed through the state Senate thanks to a four-day teacher walkout in April 1990. It was signed into law by Governor Bellman, raised taxes over the years, and imposed educational reforms, including limits on class sizes, higher teacher salaries, and a variety of other reforms. The increase in taxes did generate a backlash. There was a state question 639 the next year in 1991, which sought to repeal House Bill 1017. However, this was defeated at the polls. We to this day have an Education Reform Revolving Fund, better known as the 1017 Fund, which funds public schools in Oklahoma, among other sources. And about one third of public school funding still runs through that account. In 1992, Tax opponents tried again, but this time they did succeed in passing State Question 640. That question made it very difficult to raise taxes in Oklahoma. We can see some increases in revenue by tweaking certain regulations or deductions, but an actual increase in taxes can only take place by one of three methods. The House and Senate can pass a tax increase by a 75% supermajority and have that signed into law by the governor. This has happened only once in history, and in fact that was last month, when another eminent teacher walkout in Oklahoma pressured the legislature into finally passing some taxes to improve school funding. Another method by which taxes can be increased in Oklahoma is for the legislature to refer to a vote of the people a tax increase. It has tried that twice, once in 2004, with a tobacco tax that passed, and again in 2005 with a motor fuel tax increase which failed. The third way in which taxes can be increased in Oklahoma is by an initiative petition process to bring it to a vote of the people. The most recent example of that was in 2016 when a one penny sales tax meant to fund a teacher pay raise and other educational items went before voters but failed. Significant problem with State Question 640 is that while it makes it very hard to raise taxes in Oklahoma, it presents no barriers to lowering them, and lowering taxes is a popular thing for legislators to do. Oklahoma's income tax top rate was historically 7%, but in the mid-90s, after House Bill 1017 had run its course and improved schools, legislators began reducing the income tax rate. They reduced it dramatically in the mid-2000s and then continued a series of reductions, which eventually helped lead to statewide revenue shortfalls in 2016. Because of the crisis that generated, the legislature did eventually repeal even further reductions in the income tax rate that had been scheduled. The income tax rate now tops out at 5%, and it is very difficult for the current makeup of the legislature to embrace permanent increases in that rate. Income taxes, by their nature, are progressive, meaning that they fall much more heavily upon the wealthy than upon the poor. This chart shows how different groups of people receive income tax benefits in 2016 from rate reductions. And you can see that the wealthiest Oklahomans generate far more savings from those tax cuts than the vast majority of Oklahomans. Further erosion of the tax base occurred with the gross production tax. In 2015, amidst an usual industry downturn, the state legislature elected to reduce the gross production tax on horizontally drilled wells from its historic 7% level down to only 2% for the first three years of production. This drastically decreased gross production taxes, which had already been lowered by the economic downturn. That, together with the income tax reductions, helped precipitate state revenue shortfalls across the state in 2016. This graph compares Oklahoma's overall fossil fuel taxes to those of other states before the recent increases the legislature passed. You can see that Oklahoma is relatively low amongst other states in its taxation of fossil fuels, and that low status has helped what encourage the legislature to find the will to increase the gross production tax on horizontal wells from
from the low 2% up to now 5%, although it still remains below the historic 7% level that is on legacy wells. The low tax burden in Oklahoma may not be obvious unless you travel to other states. Here you can see a chart showing relative tax burden as a percentage of your personal income and thus adjusting for the fact that people naturally are wealthier or poorer overall in different states. This way it's looking at how much of your income goes into taxes. And you can see that Oklahoma is near the bottom. When you add up property tax, income tax, and sales and excise taxes, Oklahoma's tax burden is 47th out of the 50 states, putting us 19% below the regional average and 23% below the national average. This extremely low tax burden in turn means that the state is starved of services. Schools have been particularly hard hit in recent years by state funding declines. This chart shows how state funding declined from fiscal year 08 to fiscal year 18, yet the enrollment in schools increased. By growing by over 50,000 students, but seeing annual funding drop by almost 200 million, you can see why schools would become desperate for funding and in deep trouble. This chart illustrates the magnitude of the problem. It shows the per pupil funding in states across the nation since 2008. Oklahoma by far led the nation in the amount of lost funding per student, and that helped precipitate the crisis leading to the recent statewide teacher walkout. And the school people hear a lot of times from voters is what about the lottery money? Voters remember that the lottery was passed and it was supposed to benefit common schools. The reality is that the income to schools from lottery and gaming sources is dwarfed by the amount of revenue schools have lost due to income tax cuts and gross production tax cuts. In 2013, the income tax cuts cost 3.4 times more than what the lottery was generating. In 2014, the horizontal drilling tax cuts cost 3.6 times more than what the lottery was generating. And in the graph, you can see that in 2016, the total income tax rate cuts over time caused a loss in revenue that completely swallowed up all the new revenues generated by lottery and gaming revenues to schools. And that you'll hear about school funding that can be confusing is when you're told that overall school revenues are increasing, and yet schools are always complaining that they've had such cuts. This graph helps explain what's going on. The top line in red is the state funding. And you can see that that funding did drop significantly around 2010 and stayed at a reduced level. That's bad because as the years go by, the state population and thus the school population keeps increasing and inflation makes things more expensive. So you need revenues to go up over time, not hold flat. The blue line does show the right trend. That's local ad valorem or property taxes. And they have grown steadily over time. That would be as the tax base grows, the revenues grow, and that helps schools deal with teaching more kids and the increasing costs due to inflation. The bottom line is federal funding. We don't have much control over that. You see some rises and falls in that as various stimulus measures come and go. Here's a look at total per pupil revenue from all sources that helps you visualize the issue. From 20, 2006 to 2017, you can see that if you look at the first years, the average per pupil funding for students in constant dollars corrected for inflation was about $9,434. But then that decreased and now was about $8,760 per pupil or down 7% over the next five years. That reduction in funding is what helped create a school funding crisis. Here's a look at overall tax revenues to the state. And so you can see symptoms of the eroded tax base and economic cycles. This is from 2006 to 2017. And the bottom part of the bar graph in brown is the net individual income tax revenues. Now you'll recall that those revenues would have been impacted by constant decreases in the tax rate. 
So people that like to decrease individual income tax rates will point out that even though there was a drop in revenue for a while in income taxes, they then started to grow again as the rates continued to fall. However, that trend did not hold. And in 2015 and beyond, you can see that even though rates were declining, income tax being collected was declining. And that precipitated the crisis of state revenue shortfalls in 2016, coupled with the changes in the red part of the graph. That's the gross production taxes. And you can see a huge change from 2015 to 2016 in how big the red part was. As the gross production tax fell due to an industry cycle and big cuts in horizontal well amounts, that together with the drop in income tax created a revenue crisis for the state, which led to cuts. Overall, this graph shows that from 2006 to 2017, while the state population grew 9%, its overall tax collections had only risen 4%. Here's a look at what happened in recent years to Bartlesville Public Schools. At the bottom is the initial allocation to the district from the state in blue for 13-14, and then a slightly lower amount that the district actually received. It was shorted about $62,000, and that was absorbed by the district's carryover fund. The next year, another small loss occurred of about $17,000 that was absorbed by the district's carryover fund. Then in 15-16, there was massive losses, almost $400,000 in lost funding from the state due to revenue shortfalls. This was nearly matched the next year by another $380,000 in lost revenue. Those revenue shortfalls severely impacted the district's carryover fund and caused some pretty hard changes for the district. Here's a look at the district's carryover fund, its percentage over time. And you can see that for a long time, it held at a healthy 14 or 15%, allowing the district to have enough money left over to cover revenue shortfalls, emergency spending, and most importantly to the district, have enough money to make its December payrolls. Because each December is a low point for the district when it is relying on its carryover fund to carry it through payroll as it waits for local ad valorem taxes to finally come in in January. A safe level for a district of our size to have as carryover is 5%. And you can see that we got all the way down to that level in 2016 17, meaning that we were nearly out of money in December of that year if we didn't take action. And so the district did. In this close-up look at what happened with the fund balance, you'll see that when the fund balance hit that low point of just over 5% in 2016, the district responded by making a massive $1.9 million local budget reduction, reducing teaching positions, administrative positions, and support positions. It also went to voters, and local voters agreed to raise their property taxes so that about $700,000 a year in operating expenses for the district could be shifted to bond funds. This is tricky to do because you cannot use bond funds to pay salaries and you can't use it for consumables. So the district has had to struggle to identify any items it can that can be bonded and thus move expenses into bond funds and thus free up money in its general fund for salaries and operating expenses. We're very grateful to voters for that change and we're now very dependent on it to keep us afloat. You can see that with those changes, the fund balance was able to build up slightly to 6% last year. It might reach 7% this year if we're lucky. We just don't know yet. Here's a look at the staff reductions that occurred here in Bartlesville. You can see that in 2015-16, we had 435 teachers, but the next year we only had 409, and we've held at that lower level since then. You'll also notice that administrators were reduced from 28 down to 24 now, and support staff were increased, decreased drastically. Now, that support staff number is interesting because it was 412 and is now all the way down to only 253 projected for next year. But that doesn't mean that those positions are really entirely gone. They're just local support staff positions that we don't run anymore. We've outsourced many functions such as school age care, custodians, lawn services, and now next year child nutrition to reduce overhead for the district 
so that we don't have to use administrative overhead to run those positions. Instead, we pay a vendor to take on those roles. This does reduce the district's costs. And so you can see that the actual number of employees directly employed by the district has fallen by almost 22% since 2015-16, projecting out to next year. The biggest challenge for the district for years now has been the teacher shortage. This is a view of results from a survey of over 250 former Oklahoma teachers who left the profession, asking them where they went and what they were doing. And the average pay increase for those teachers who left the state was $19,000. About half of the teachers leaving the state in that study went to Texas. Another 20% went to other states. And the remainder were staying in Oklahoma but had left the teaching profession. Here's another look at why the teacher shortage became such an acute problem for Bartlesville and other districts around Oklahoma. This year, we have now reached dead last, 50th in absolute pay according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics for our elementary and secondary school teachers. The map shows what a secondary school teacher in Bartlesville could earn in other areas. By traveling over to the Bentonville area in Arkansas, they could net about $12,600 more on average. By going to the Dallas-Fort Worth area, they could yield over $15,000 more, and so forth. So this causes a drain of teachers across the state to nearby states, especially nearby metro areas, where they can make considerably more money and avoid burdens like having to have a second or third job to make ends meet for their family. Graph shows the magnitude of the teacher shortage across the state. Back in 2011-2012, there were only 32 teachers in the state who needed emergency certification. Those are cases where a district certifies to the state that it simply can't find a qualified teacher for a position and needs to emergency certify someone into the job to make do. You can see that that was a rare occurrence back then, but now it's become quite common. In fact, there's now over 2,000 emergency certified teachers in the state as of this moment. Bartlesville is not immune to that problem and currently has about a dozen teachers who are teaching in classrooms yet lack the normal certifications required. Bartlesville got to the point, like districts across the state, where it was hiring people for jobs that it wouldn't have even interviewed in years before. These problems of massive cuts to public schools on per pupil basis and the teacher's salaries being so low are what helped lead to the 2018 teacher walkout and, thankfully, to some major reforms and funding that came about right before the walkout began. Of a statewide teacher walkout in early April helped prompt the legislature in late March to finally pass a tax increase by the required 75% supermajority in both the House and the Senate, and Governor Fallon signed that into law. This should provide the largest teacher pay raise in state history, which will help address the teacher shortage, and will also constitute the largest increase in state public school funding in state history in a single year period, with over $480 million more million flowing into the schools. It's worth noting that the plan passed by the state was based on the Bartlesville plan the district had promoted. Representative Earl Sears tweaked that plan and took it forward in the legislature, and finally, it morphed into the bipartisan plan that actually passed. That teacher pay raise is significant. It is over $6,000 on average, and so a new teacher with a bachelor's degree and no teaching experience will receive $5,000 more than they would this year when they start teaching next year. And experienced teachers with 25 years or more experience can yield $8,000 increases in teacher salary. If you look at the regional comparisons, Oklahoma has been dead last in the region in teacher salary for many, many years. So this is an impressive change, skyrocketing Oklahoma past the regional average temporarily to below that of Texas. So while teachers in Texas will still make more on average than teachers in Oklahoma, we sh will make significant headway against Arkansas and Kansas and other nearby states for a while. And this should help address the teacher shortage. However, of course, over time, Oklahoma will have to increase teacher salaries again to remain competitive. 
Other improvements from the re recent legislation is a support pay raise of $1,250 to directly employed support employees in school districts. However, this does not apply to outsourced employees. So only employees like secretaries and paraprofessionals in special education rooms and district maintenance workers in the sort in Bartlesville can receive that pay raise. It won't apply to the various positions we have already outsourced. Textbooks has been a sore spot for districts because the funding for textbooks was never enough from the state at only $33 million, which is about less than $50 per book. And a book typically costs $80 or more when it's in a textbook for a school. But it certainly was necessary funding, which was diverted from 2010 to 2015 for other needs as districts fell into financial straits. And in fact, that entire textbook funding was fully eliminated in 2016. So that funding has been restored and earmarked to textbooks and will help somewhat. There also is some funding for the annual increase in health insurance costs. Uh, the state has a flexible benefit allowance, which provides health insurance coverage for school employees, but not for their families or their spouses. There also is a slight increase in operational funding, but it's not significant at $17 million. In fact, the in February, there was a reduction of operational funding to schools of $22 million, so this increase doesn't even make up for that loss. Locally, Bartlesville will gain $145,000 in operational funding from that small increase, but will already be losing $380,000 due to changes in enrollment, so the district will still be losing money next year for operations. Here's a look at overall tax revenues to the state with the new taxes added in. So it's the same graph you saw before, but if we assume all the other taxes are stable, we don't really know where they'll land, but then add in the new taxes in red in the final column, you can kind of get a sense of scale for how big these tax increases are and how they impact the state revenues. The state is expecting growth revenue, so the overall bar should be even higher. And that added growth revenue is hopefully going to be enough to cover the cost of state employee pay raises the legislature passed and might address some other critical needs such as corrections, mental health, and so forth. We'll have to stay tuned to see what happens. I provide some insight into the increase in state aid to schools. Now, this isn't really state aid per pupil, it's per weighted average daily membership, and that reflects some weights that are given to students in the funding formula for students who are rural versus urban, students who may be in special education versus regular education, and so forth. So it's not so important what the numbers are, but the length of the bars. And you can see that in 2019, we'll see a sizable increase in that bar, about 12% higher. However, it's worth noting that if you adjust for inflation, we still won't be in real dollars as well off as we were, say, in 2010 because the increase in costs due to inflation will have eaten away that 12% gain. Here's a graph that shows something that still disturbs teachers and school folks, and it's why the teacher walkout still continued despite the record increase in teacher salaries. This is per pupil spending across the states. And if you look at the per pupil column near the right end, you'll see that Oklahoma is still dead last in the region. And this is after we impose the expected new revenues from the tax increases that were recently passed. So even with that big boost in funding, Oklahoma is projected to only spend about $8,700 per student and all the states around us will be spending more. In fact, for us to reach the regional average and per pupil spending would require that we invest over 700 million more dollars than we do now in our public school system. Now, granted, it was a lot worse before these tax increases. It's narrowed by 419 million from what it would have been, but it's still a very large deficit in how much we spend per pupil. So while our teacher salaries will be more competitive, we will still have the problems that come with very low per pupil funding. One of those problems is that we simply don't have as many course offerings in Oklahoma. Because of the continual cuts in state funding and operations that still are not being addressed, we can see that over 500 world language courses have been eliminated across the state over the past four years. There are fewer art and music classes and other electives are gone. It's particularly disturbing to notice that 
one third of Oklahoma's high schools no longer offer a single foreign language course. And in the graph, you can see that in our area, the number of world language courses in 2006, 2006, 2007 was much healthier than it was 10 years later. We also will have the problem of large class sizes that are not being addressed by the tax increases. House Bill 1017 had phased in class size limits where we were supposed to only have 20 students or less in elementary school classes and secondary school teachers should not see more than 140 students per day. And there were always various exceptions to those rules for districts that had certain levels of bonding or millage and of course certain types of classes. But those limits really have no power anymore. They've been waived for almost all districts and are routinely exceeded. Reinstating those limits and bringing class sizes back down to these norms would require much more operational funding for schools so that they could hire more teachers. In other words, it's great to pay more to teachers so that you can attract qualified candidates, but you also need enough money to hire more teachers to deal with this issue. Common complaint about Oklahoma schools is that there's simply too many districts. Here's a historical chart showing that at statehood, there were over 5,600 school districts in rural Oklahoma. And as Oklahoma has urbanized, schools have been combined. And now there are about 520 or so districts in the state. This is still higher than in some other states. In fact, we're eighth in the nation in the number of districts. But you do need to keep in mind that this also reflects our rural character. Oklahoma is fourth in the nation in a number of farms even to this day with over one third of our residents living in rural areas that have less than 2,500 residents. So we have the 16th highest rural population. So we do need to consolidate more, particularly in Eastern Oklahoma rather than the Western Oklahoma, but it will be difficult to consolidate. One way to try and urge districts to continue to consolidate is to offer a carrot of increased incentive funding if they'll do so. And that's the approach House Bill 1017 enacted in 1990, and it was effective. It reduced the number of districts from about 600 down to about 520 or so. So that could be built upon as a way to further reduce districts by offering some incentive funding. It's very difficult to get districts to consolidate because many towns are extremely resistant in rural Oklahoma to consolidation because of the impact on the community if they lose their local district. One thing to keep in mind as you consider district consolidations is the number of pupils per administrator. And this is information I haven't seen widely shared elsewhere. The US average for the number of pupils per administrator is about 294.1. And this doesn't fluctuate a whole lot of, in this region for the high end. You can see that Oklahoma is near the high end at 294.7. Only Missouri has more students per administrator. But you can see that Texas, for example, has far fewer pupils per administrator than we do. So as we continue cons to consolidate, Oklahoma will likely rise to be the highest number of pupils per administrator in our region. So there is a practical limit to how far we can go before those numbers become a real problem here about districts is they need to reduce their administrative costs. What many people don't understand is how the money is spent in school because it sounds like wouldn't it all go to the classroom. So these pie charts can help take things apart and see what's going on. If you look at the upper pie chart you can see that about 57 percent of k-12 expenditures are directly on classroom instruction. So you might say well where's all that other money going? Well it's support services. So if you take apart that 36% down below and break apart that wedge, you can see that that's paying for things like guidance counselors, nurses, speech pathologists, curriculum development, staff training, which is really important with emergency certified teachers, libraries, computers, operating the district and buildings, busing kids around, and so on. These are all vital functions to making a school operate with the modern clientele and they're not really administrative in the sense of just bureaucratic overhead. If you look at administrative costs in Oklahoma, that's the circled in red part, it's about 8.4%. If we want to put this in perspective, Oklahoma is about 25th out of the 50 states in school district administration. 
So consolidation, for example, would help somewhat with that figure. But there will be a lot of rural resistance in the state Senate to any consolidation efforts. But something that's very important to bear in mind is how little money we're really talking about. I'm going to flip back and remind you that administrative costs are only 8.4% of the entire budget for schools. So if you somehow magically eliminated all district administrative costs, you got rid of every administrator altogether, and put all that money directly into the classroom, what impact would it have? And sadly, you'd find out that it wouldn't change our ranking on per pupil instructional spending, even by one rank in the nation. There just isn't that money, much money available in a district administration that making administrative cuts can make a big impact on instruction. So consolidation is a good thing and it makes sense to be more efficient, but it certainly will not solve the operational funding dilemma for Oklahoma schools. It'll be a small help if implemented. So what's the final message here? Well, we've come a long ways in terms of teacher salaries for next year, and that will help us begin to address the teacher shortage. But schools in Oklahoma still need a lot more money flowing through the school funding formula for operations. We are still dead last in the region in per pupil funding, and for us to reach the original average would cost over $730 million in new revenues to schools. So one concept for how to make schools better in Oklahoma going forward is to close that gap. Maybe over a three year period, have a goal of cutting that gap by 250 million a year. And why would you want to pour that money into schools? So that you can restore classes that have been dropped and so that you can bring class sizes back down and improve instruction and thus student achievement and outcomes. So that's a general concept and I'm sure that in the coming months, we'll see efforts both in Bartlesville and around the state of people coming to grips with what are some realistic goals for increasing per pupil funding tied to specific reforms and improvements in education that would make that money worthwhile to the taxpayers to improve schools and thus the state's future. I've shown you a lot of information to try and digest about school funding. So if you'd like to pull up this slideshow and review it at your leisure, you can do so at bpspresents.org. There's a PDF there of the slideshow, which you can print out or just review on your computer page by page, and thus take a look at whatever data you'd like. Thanks for your attention, and I appreciate your time.